Hello and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment the podcast. Today I'm honored to have Travis Chapel with me. Travis is the host of the podcast Build Your Network, which uh, has over a million downloads. So it's uh, one of the top 200 podcasts in the in the world. And he's also uh, working on a new business venture, which is being the founder of Guestio, the app. So uh, Travis, I appreciate you being on. And one thing that uh, you're all going to uh, take away from our conversation is Travis is willing to, I would say it this way, pivot from what he thought he wanted to where he sees himself going and he's coachable. So I think there's going to be a lot of good nuggets coming from today. So Travis, thanks for being here. Hey, hey thanks for having me, Phil. I uh, appreciate, appreciate you bringing me on. You bet. So I want to kick it off with um, the fifth grade version of Travis. So in fifth grade, we start having some uh, entrepreneurial ideas. So talk a little bit about that business mindset at an early age. Yeah. So uh, fifth grade, I, um, so first of all, my, I have one sibling, it's my sister. She is like 18 months older than I am. So we're, we're pretty close in age. And yeah. growing up, I always wanted to like, you know, do the things that she was doing, play the things she was playing. So my parents got her easy bake oven and I was like, I want one of those. And they're like, you can't have one of those. Uh, you're a boy. And, uh, <laughs> And so they got me a creepy crawler oven. And so what it was, you could like squirt a little uh, liquid into these um, metal molds yeah. and put it in the oven and turn it on. And then you could get these little plastic rubber bugs that you made out of them. Yeah. And uh, I started, you know, having them at school and stuff. And then other kids want to play with them. And so I was like, oh, maybe I can sell these. So I... <laughs> I, you know, at the time it was just like, I just want more money so I can like buy an ice cream at lunch or whatever. <laughs> and so it was like, I would sell them for a quarter or 50 cents. If it was like, if it was multicolored, you know, it was 50 cents or if the size of it, it would change with the size of the, the bug or whatever. So yeah. yeah, that was like my first, my first ever thing that I just kind of did without anybody prompting me or telling me it was a good idea. I was just kind of like, oh, this, this makes sense. Let's, let's just do this for a little while, you know? I probably yeah. made like a grand total of $5 on it, but you know, it is what it is. Absolutely. It was a learning lesson. It was a learning lesson. And a second thing that, you know, I would say as, as we look back on it really helped you grow um, your work ethic was growing up your, your parents would help you or pay you for your help on the farm, but they didn't let you just take it and go spend it. So I want you to talk about, you know, the values instilled with you in hard work, but then in, you know, kind of money management, if you will. Yeah, I think my parents did a really good job with this kind of stuff. You know, I didn't grow up in a wealthy household, but we didn't do without. And we were, you know, I would say solid middle class. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, the, the most valuable thing that I think my parents passed on to me was, uh, was being disciplined with your finances. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so uh, for the most part, my parents basically bought everything growing up in terms of, you know, obviously food, clothes and all yeah. that stuff. But if I wanted anything extra, you know, and it wasn't my birthday, it wasn't Christmas. If I wanted anything on top of the stuff that they already paid for, like school and whatever, um, I had to go work for it. And yep. so we had we had two acres and constantly full of weeds. And so they would just say, Well, go go weed and we'll pay you. I think it's like five bucks an hour. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, you're right. When they would pay me, they didn't just pay me the money and let me do whatever I wanted. They, we, 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 they bought me these, like uh, me and my sister, we had these like little plastic banks, uh, like piggy banks. And there was three sections of them. One of them was a church. One of them was a store and one of them was a bank. And they would make us save 20%, tithe 10%, and then we could keep 70%. Um, yeah. to, like, so we put 70% in the store, 20% in the bank, and then um, so on and so forth. And you don't think it like is that much money when you're a kid, but what would happen is like every time the bank side of the, the piggy bank would get full of dollar bills and coins and stuff, they would empty it out and they'd go put it in a mutual funds uh, yeah. account for us. Um, and so by the time I was graduating high school, we had, I had like 10 grand in the, in a, in a mutual funds account. And my sister also had 10 grand and this was like 2010. So it was right after the housing crisis. Yeah. Real estate was super cheap. So my parents combined mine and my sister's money, which would have been like twenty three, twenty four thousand dollars, and used it as a down payment on a duplex for us. And like that was our first investment was money that we had saved growing up from yeah. allowances and uh, Christmas money, birthday money, working on the lawn, working in the yard, you know, doing extra work on the weekends or whatever. And you know, it, it, I think it was it was a very you know 
a valuable lesson that like, if you want more things in life, they don't get handed to you. You have to go work to go get them. And it teaches you the value of what a dollar is. You know, there's people to this day that are in their twenties that have never earned a dollar. Yep. They, they go from working with, you know, living with their parents to living with a spouse that pays for them. And it's just like, you never understand what, you know, the value of a dollar bill until you've had to go earn that dollar bill. And, uh, and then eventually just kind of like started hitting, hitting me that like, I didn't have to work that hard for a dollar. I mean, before I was like, I'm working in a full hour of manual labor to make $5 bills. You know what I mean? But right. I eventually started, you know, becoming better and better um, throughout life. But I, I think that, that those, those lessons early on were, were instrumental in how like I've, I viewed uh, uh, money and, and then how I, I treated money in my own life as well. Yeah. So Continuing on the the train of kind of entrepreneurial and things, uh, you grew up going to a, uh, we'll just say a, a faith based school and school system. And so, in the seventh and eighth grade, part of your task was going door to door and not selling like your cuteness as like a seventh and an eighth grader, but uh, bringing people to faith or at least coming to church. So, talk about that because I mean, talk about <laughs> b- building the thick skin that one must have going door to door, having that conversation. Yeah, dude, it was just normal growing up. I, I we did that in elementary school. Um, even we, we had on Saturdays, it was called soul winning and you'd go out, knock doors, invite people to come to church and like try to lead them to the Lord. I do. I, I was in like seventh grade, eighth grade, knocking on people's doors, like full grown adults and being like, Hey, come to church. And then like, after we talk for like three or four minutes, I would pop this question on them and say something like, do you know that if you died today, if you would go to heaven or hell, I'm like a 13 year old kid asking this to a full grown adult <laughs> like, like I had the ultimate answer, you know, but I, yeah. I, I would, it would happen. Yeah. And I remember like there was a couple of days where you'd come back with like three conversions on people's doorsteps and, yeah. and you bring them to church the next day. Cause it's Sunday and get them involved in the church and the community and stuff, you know, it's just like, it was such a crazy uh, thing to, to kind of, to kind of grow up in. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I guess I just, I guess so I just wasn't afraid to knock on doors because it, it was just what we did, you know, is what everybody did. Yeah. Well, one thing that I think is, you know, interesting about your comment there that it, it, later on in life, you know, as you transition a little bit away, not from necessarily a faith life, but from that specific um, you know, denomination or church is that you said, you know, I, I felt like I didn't have an open mind to others later in my life uh, when it came to faith, right? I was asking them to believe what I believe, but if they wanted to talk to me about their stance, it was just no. And so talk a bit about, you know, having conviction in what it is that you believe, but also being able to entertain kind of maybe an opposing viewpoint or one that just doesn't match up directly with what you believe. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is why I don't have a high tolerance for hypocritical people or fake people in my life, regardless of if it's in the religious context or business context, There's a lot of fake it till you make it in the business world. Yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of tolerance for that because probably of the way that I grew up and one of the biggest, you know, self-awareness realizations that I had early on, like as a, as a young adult in my, you know, late teens, early twenties, like 19, 20, 21 was I was, so convinced of everything that I believed that I was willing to go tell everybody about it. And I wanted everybody to come to my church and hear what I had to say, because I believed I had the truth. Mm-hmm. What I started to realize is that a lot of these other people that I'm talking to, they think the same thing, right? Like they grew up in uh, maybe a different part of the world and grew up with a different set of beliefs, a different set of values, a different religion, a different belief system. And they believed that just as much as I believed what I believed. Yeah. And I was asking those people to throw everything that they've ever thought or believed up into the air and come over to see my perspective on things. And then as soon as they would ask me to do the same, I would meet it with just like almost laughter at how ridiculous it would be if I would like, oh, I'm not going to go to your Mormon church. I'm not going to go to your mosque. Like, ha ha yeah. ha, you know, but you can come to my church though. Yeah. You know, it was just like, a, <laughs> just one day it was just kind of like, I feel like this is the height of hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. It, 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 like I, I'm trying to convince everybody else about how smart I am and about how, um, how I have the truth and they don't have the truth when they believe they have it just as much as I do. Yep. And like, it's not a matter of who's right or wrong. At that point, it's a matter of who's a better salesperson. And I think I just mm-hmm. had a kind of a natural ability to sell and persuade in, um, and I, you know, was using that. <clears throat> yeah. 
to do that. But at the time, at the time, it was just kind of like a slap in the face of, man, if I'm asking all these people to abandon everything that they knew and everything that like the foundation that they built their lives on, I'm asking people to abandon that and come see the world from my perspective. I should at least be willing to see the world from their, from their perspective for a second. Yeah. I think that's so critical. Um, you know, in once again, we won't go down this rabbit hole for too long, but just the idea in, you know, um, faith, oftentimes people will switch between faith and religion and religion is kind of like a man-made thing, right? Faith and, you know, things that go into that are less man-made in certain opinions. Right. And it's really just being able to, you know, decipher that of, Hey, you know, this was a person's rule that they made versus a, what I truly believe from a faith standpoint. Yeah, because the bottom line is this, man. If it were completely obvious, we would all agree. Yep. So it's obviously not completely obvious. <laughs> right. So at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is how you specifically translate what it is and how it means to you. Mm-hmm. And uh, and if somebody's trying to tell you that you're wrong, it's because they believe that they are translating that in the correct way. The problem is, is that I can go find two dozen other people that believe something different based on the same rule that you're saying that you believe what you believe on. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's why I just like, I stopped looking down on people for the, the, the belief systems that they had or way they chose to live their life. And, um, you know, did me a lot of good. Absolutely. So rewinding a little bit, once again, we fast forward there, but we will rewind a little bit here. Um, in, in high school, you started a landscaping company. So once again, there's this entrepreneurial mindset for you, you know, whether it's creating the uh, creepy crawlers or it's working for the Paris, but talk a little bit about the idea of creating a landscaping uh, company and how you scaled that even. Yeah. So like, that was really the best way that I knew how to make money. That was what correlated to making money for me growing up. Cause like I said, you know, uh, prior to that point, I would just work on um, our own yard and my parents would pay me uh, to work on our yard. You know, there would be like entire Saturdays growing up when I was like, I don't know, 14 or 13 or 14, where I'd have a couple friends over and literally eight hours of manual labor being in the hot desert sun of Southern California, like taking a hoe to massive weeds in the acreage that we had raking them into piles, burning them like for six bucks an hour or whatever. So when I was uh, uh, coming into my senior year, after I got my driver's license, basically, um, you know, we had our lawnmower and stuff. And my, my parents at the time had some rental properties. uh, That was kind of what they invested in. And then my dad was also a real estate agent. And so he had a a flipper that was working with him a lot Mm -hmm. and uh, giving him a good amount of business. And so um, uh, that, that flipper started uh, needing lipstick done to the lawns. You know what I mean? I'd say lipstick yeah. because it's like, it's not like it's a complete overhaul and we weren't doing crazy work, but it was like, Hey, this lawn is dead. Sprinklers yeah. broken. So we would go in and we would clear it, put in sod, fix the sprinkler system and get it back up and running so we could sell it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so it was me and a buddy of mine uh, that, that I brought into it. And uh, we started with just my, my parents, you know, lawn mower, and we'd go around every week, mow all the lawns of like some of their properties. And we had a couple other clients uh, that were people that had bought houses from my dad. And so we, um, you know, got their business. And so, you know, we had like 10 to 15 lawns that we were mowing every week. And then yeah. we had um, these one-off kind of landscaping, uh, you know, grass sod installation projects that we would do for a couple, a couple other investors and flippers and things like that. And so, um, yeah, that was summer before senior year. And I remember, I remember, uh, right, right when senior year started, I had just sold two jobs, um, to the same investor and <clears throat> we were in school at that point. So school yeah. had started, you know, the summer, you know, I, I don't know, we probably made like 10 grand that summer each, which, you know, as a 16 year old is like, Oh, I'm rich. Yeah. You know, <laughs> No, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe even total. I don't know. Like we, we I probably had like two or $3,000 to my name, but I thought I was balling. And so we're sitting, uh, in class, you know, obviously, you know, I got football practice. I got homework. I got school. I can't do the work on these jobs. Can't do the labor on these jobs. So we hired a couple of college students to go do the labor on the jobs for us. And I remember sitting in class, writing out, doing all the math of how much money we were going to make on that deal. Yep. And I was like, and I'm going to make just as much money as the people that I hired to do the manual labor on these jobs. And I'm sitting in class right now. Yeah. Like, and it was one of those big, you know, aha moments of like, whoa, creating the customer relationship is seemingly much more valuable than just fulfilling 
the 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 uh, project. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was it was one of those big lessons that that I think I, I learned early on. Um, now in like that culture that I kind of grew up in, you know, they do their best to kind of suppress a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't act on that uh, beyond uh, beyond that until I was gone and out of that world for a while. But uh, but yeah, I mean, landscape the landscaping thing taught me a lot. It taught me about what I didn't want to do. I I I stopped. Uh, I stopped doing it in college and me and my buddy that I started with actually had kind of a falling out because he was using it as his main income and wanted to keep doing the lawns. I didn't want to do it anymore, but we used my truck and my equipment and everything like that. So like it, it I learned a lot from it, man. Like it, it was like recently this happened uh, where there was, uh, it wasn't with my company, but it was a, a client of ours and a company that they were working with and they had a nasty split and they were not dealing with it very well. And um, I was just like, uh, I asked, I asked the guy like, you know, what experience the other person had. And it was like, oh, this is their first business. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Right. But I didn't, you don't, you don't think about the fact that like, man, when I was like, I had my first ugly business deal with a, one of my like best friends when I was like 18, right. you know, and then like that happened again at 21 and that happened again at 24 and that happened again at 26. You know what I mean? So you, you like, you just pick up on a lot of those experiences along the way. Yes. So as you're graduating from high school and you're heading into college, so you mentioned that um, kind of the system, the college system you're in was mostly designed to keep you in the church and then to help you, you know, doing that type of a vocation. And at some point you decided, you know, I don't know that that's the route that I want to go, though. I think I want to check out something else outside of it, sales, entrepreneurial, something else. So talk uh, a bit about that pivot and that switch and, uh, you know, everything that comes with that. Yeah, that was easily the most difficult pivot of my life because it's, it's hard to explain to anybody that didn't grow up the way that I grew up. But like I graduated kindergarten on the same campus that I graduated college from. Yeah. My youth pastors were my teachers. My teachers were my, were my sports coaches. Like the entire world existed in its own place. It was very much a, a bubble that I grew up in. I started going to the church when I was three. I was enrolled in kindergarten at five and I graduated college at 21 on the same campus, the same 40 acre campus, yeah. which is also the place that we went soul winning on Saturdays, same place that I went to church on Sundays. We had church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We had chapel, you know, Monday and Friday and we had Bible class every day. We didn't have chapel and we had soul winning rally on Saturday plus soul winning Saturday. And then I served in the bus ministry on Sunday. So I was getting there like 6 a.m. from the time that I was like 14 and was volunteering on a bus route for four years, giving up almost all of my Sunday. Um, and then I would get home on Sunday afternoon at like four o'clock from dropping all the kids off at Sunday morning church. And I would relax for an hour, get ready for night church at 530. You know, we had missions conferences and youth conferences and spiritual leadership conferences. Like, I don't know how many services I attended <laughs> from, the from the time that I was three to the time I was 21, but yeah. it's in the thousands, you know? Right. And, and when I, when you, when you grow up in that context and you go to the college that's on that same campus, it's a purely ministerial college. And so their goal is getting students out into ministry. And so when you are deciding like the whole time you have chapel every day, you're always hearing stories about people who gave up on the ministry thing and they ruined their lives. And so you have all this kind of this guilt associated with it. You think it's the only correct path in life. Mm -hmm. You don't think there's another other, um, there's another option for you. Yeah. So like when I say that I left and started doing something different, it was like months and months of turmoil and losing sleep. And um, right. I would say, I would mention it to a friend or two and they would shut it down immediately and be like, no, 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 you got to do the ministry. Like you got to stay in ministry. You got to do what God wants you to do, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I remember just being a really lonely time, uh, to be mm -hmm. honest, because, so I got married before I graduated college yeah. and I started thinking all these thoughts and, and thinking I didn't want to be doing this anymore. And, um, you know, it, it was just one of those like introspective periods of life where I knew I couldn't talk to anybody about it because nobody would, you know, uh, like nobody would listen for the sake of listening to me right? to give me advice based on what I thought would be best for me in my life they would only be listening so that they could hear loopholes in my conversation and convince me that what I was doing was wrong and that what mm -hmm. I should have been doing was right. Yeah. And so I just didn't talk to anybody. Didn't, didn't tell anybody, but everybody, everybody that was existed in my world at that point was in that world. Right. Didn't have anybody else out of it, you know? Um, and so, so coming out of that, it was, it was really difficult to make, make a decision to do anything different. Um, yeah let alone do something that I had no experience doing in any context prior. So, um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting time. It was an interesting time in life, man. And, and, uh, you know, obviously got, got through a lot of that and changed a lot of things about myself in the, in the coming years. And 
still, still to this day that way. Yeah. I was going to say, we could spend our entire conversation just on, just on working through that, but we won't, yeah. we'll, we'll continue to progress on. But as, so as you're making that shift out and you start taking on career elsewhere, uh, at some point you get introduced to this idea of kind of like personal development, self-help, um, you know, books, listenings, recordings, things like that. So talk about getting exposed to that and, you know, the, the doors being open to that world. Yeah, it was because the the only thing that I knew how to do when I decided I wasn't going to be in ministry was yeah. door-to-door sales. Yeah. Because that's what I did in college uh, right. to, to make extra money. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I, you know, people are like, well, it makes sense that you were good because you, um, you know, were knocking doors when you were like 12 or whatever. <laughs> but a lot of my friends that grew up the same way I did, didn't convert well into door-to-door sales at the time. So for, for whatever reason, maybe, you know, it could be like, I grew up in a, in a real estate household. I saw my dad, he was hundred percent commission all the time. And so that could be something to do with it. Maybe it was just natural. I don't really know, but yeah. um, for that, whatever reason, I, I started doing pretty well with door, door to door in college and, and got promoted my first week, got promoted my fourth week, got promoted again, like two months later, was running a team. And like within six months, I had a team of like 20 guys that, wow. that I was managing. We're knocking doors in one of the you know top producing areas in the region. And, and so after I figured I wasn't going to be in Bible college, I was like, well, Nobody's gonna hire. Nobody's gonna hire me, right? Because I have an unaccredited Bible degree that doesn't do anything. <laughs> so, like, my option at this point is like, what? Go get a desk job that pays me fifteen dollars an hour and makes me report to somebody that I don't respect for forty hours a week, and I have like two weeks off a year. That was like crushing to me. I was like, two weeks? Who takes two weeks off? Like, I want to be able to do whatever I want when I want. Right. And uh, so, door to door was that option for me. It was hundred percent commission. I could work when I wanted to, and I my income was in my control. Yep. And so I did door to door and I cracked six figures my first year. And what happened at the end of that was counterintuitive. You would think it would be like, oh, 22 year old kid making six figures. You're happy. You're going to keep doing that for a long time. For me, it was just a realization that I didn't want to be doing it because I, I looked at my 32 year old self and I was like, I don't want to be doing what I'm 32. Yep. And if I keep doing this for the next 10 years, I'm like best case scenario, I might be able to double my income. Yeah. Like I can get, I can get incrementally better. I can get more people on my team. I can manage them better. Maybe I can open my own office. Maybe I, you know, but, but like, I'm going to be capped at like a quarter million, mm-hmm. which is not what I want to be doing. Yep. And so at that point it was like more of an existential crisis than it was before. Cause now I had nothing to fall back on. I had my Bible degree and I had door to door experience and I had nothing else. Right. So I had no idea what I was going to do. And at this point in my life, bro, I felt like I was a 15 year old kid again. Genuinely, I was like, man, do I go be like a firefighter? Like I was looking up at like FBI applications because we were watching an FBI show on TV at the time. And I was like, oh, that was like that. That seems cool. I could do that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I even like looked at the military again. I was just like, I was, what do I do? What do I do with my life? You know what yeah. I mean? The difference was is I had a mortgage to pay and a wife and other bills on my plate. So I couldn't just like go sleep on my parents' couch until I figured it out. <laughs> It was like a back against the wall moment. And yeah. uh, the only thing I knew how to do was go try to find knowledge and information that I didn't currently have. And uh, that was when I jumped into personal development for the first time. So I started listening to like, you know, to Jim Rohn, some of these classic uh, yeah. guys, Jim Rohn or Zig Ziglar and um, uh, start learning a lot from them. And then was just like, what else is out there? And I started researching more, um, you know, started listening to audiobooks. Got finally got turned on to podcasts and then, um, and, uh, and then got more book recommendations from the podcast and reading more books, listening to more podcasts, you know, just consuming as much as I, as much as I could. And, yeah. um, eventually got to the point where I was like, what if I just started a podcast? It seemed like that would be kind of fun. Like, and at the time I was looking at John Lee Dumas as an example who, yep. you know, is an unfair example because he started so early on in the game and, and he's really good at what he does. And he had a, you know, his business pays him, I don't know, two to 3 million a year annually yeah. at this point, like pretty passive in terms of the actual active work that he has to do. He works like six, seven days a month and, uh, and does really well for himself. And I was like, but that's the kind of business I want a business that allows me to have autonomy, freedom, um, like time location. Like I define freedom three ways, financial time and location. Mm-hmm. If you don't have all three forms of that, you don't have true freedom. In my opinion, yeah. you can have, you know, a lot of people have financial freedom, but they got to show up to work 60 hours a week. Yep. Well, you know, they make a lot of money, but they can't do anything with the money that they have. Yep. A lot of people have time freedom, but they usually don't have any money. So like <laughs> right. they're constricted to what they can do in their local zip code because they have no money to go do anything that they want to do. Or yes. you can have time and financial freedom, but in order to make money, you got to stay where you are, which is what I was in door to door. I was like, man, even if I made a half a million a year in door to door, if I travel to Europe for a month and a half, I'm making $0 when I'm over there. 
Yeah. Unless I start my own company yep. as a door to door, you know, like I start a door to door organization. I have trainers and all that stuff I can leave. But as a door to door person, I have to physically be here. And that's why I didn't get into like real estate age, becoming a real estate agent or anything like that. Cause I, I wanted location time and financial freedom and podcasting was like, Oh, I mean, this dude lives in Puerto Rico, makes yeah. like 3 million a year, like 80% gross, 80% uh, net profit margins on the revenue that he makes and talks to all the coolest people in the world, has conversations with great people that he can build a network with. I was like, this seems like a pretty good path, you know? So let's start this podcast thing. And obviously didn't go exactly the way that it, it went for John when he started his, because I was about five years too late uh, to the game, but, uh, but you know, it ended up going, going pretty well. Yeah. So to parlay that, so you mentioned you've got bills to pay and you're deciding you want to go into this podcast thing and you say, you know what, who better to learn from than John? And I, I'm going to have to pay to do that though. So I, I might not have the money today, but I can put it on a credit card today. And I believe that if I do this in a year, I'll be able to get this stuff paid off. So talk about that, that just, you know, moment of being willing to put that money, you know, out there to pursue, you know, what you're now wanting to pursue. So the good thing about sales is that you can control your income. Yep. And so when I decided to start podcasting, I was like, this is cool, but it's not going to make money for a while. Yeah. And so a buddy of mine that I had sold alarms with got me into selling uh, water purifiers and the margins on them were much bigger. I didn't have to sell as many of them to make as much money in commissions. Um, so the year that I was doing all this research, I didn't really work for probably like half the year. I was just like going to the gym, getting myself back in good health and focusing on personal development and books and stuff. But then the last month of the year, I made like 17 grand in two weeks, knocking doors for this uh, water purification deal. Yeah. And um, so that started becoming my way of like, all right, if I really want to start investing into myself, into some of these things, I can subsidize it by working harder and going out and selling more stuff and covering the bills. And uh, that's, that was how I convinced my wife. You know, I was like, look, this, this, this weekend thing in Puerto Rico, it's $6,500 which is an exorbitant amount of money to spend on that when you've never spent any of money on that before. Right. Like the most money I'd spent was like 20 bucks on a book. You know what I mean? <laughs> so to yeah. go from that to 6,500 bucks for three days, it wasn't even like a continuous mastermind. Right, three days. right. Yeah. And um, uh, she was, uh, luckily she, she trusts my judgment on, on all of that. And she was just like, look, I know that if you spend the money, you're going to work to make it back. Hmm. And uh, so I did like that month, I, I did $20,000, which was like one of the first months I ever did 20 grand in door to door. Yeah. Uh, but I made 20 grand that month so that I could justify the $6,500 payment. But then what, it, what ended up happening is like, I, I had hired a podcast coach for 4,000. I went out there for 6,500 and I started getting addicted to investing into myself because yeah. I started seeing how it was paying off and benefiting yeah. me. And uh, so over the next 12 months, I had a 0% Chase Freedom Unlimited credit card. Um, which by the way, is another reason that you should always have good credit and not yeah. always be working on your credit. Yeah. Um, because at 24, 23, 24, I qualified for a credit card that was 0% interest for 18 months, I believe. And, um, and it was a $42,000 credit limit. So if you don't pay your bills on time and have good credit, you don't get that kind of opportunity. Right. So I, I got the credit card and I filled it up, bro masterminds, events, um, flights, hotels, coaching courses, like whatever I could get my hands on and consume. I, I did. And, uh, before I started, before I paid a diamond interest on that card, I had paid the whole thing off wow. uh, with money that, you know, that I'd made on, on the new kind of online business there. Um, and by the way, I don't recommend people do that <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> like it, it was, it was a risk, you know, yeah. uh, but that was a risk I was willing to take. Yep. at the time. And, and I'm, and I'm glad, and I'm glad that I did because I, I, to me, to me, buying information, buying coaching, buying masterminds, buying connections to me is just a shortening of your runway. Every time you do it, yep. every time you make a new investment in yourself and you do the work to make sure that it pays off, you're shortening your learning curve by a year, two years, six months, a month. You know, you buy a course, you watch half of the modules, but you learn something that really helped you. You shave three months off of your learning curve. Was that worth the 2000 bucks that it, that it cost to buy the course? Yeah, probably because three months of my time at this point in life is worth a lot of money. Yep. You know what I mean? And people are willing to pay me for that time now. Uh, so yes. if you can see like a direct correlation to your time versus how much um, money you're getting paid to do something. So when I see like something like that, it's like, oh, it's 2000 bucks. Yeah, take my money. If I can learn one thing that shortens my learning curve by four and a half months, 
that time value of money, like made me so much more money than $2,000 cost me in the first place. And so I just got into a habit of investing, in, in, of investing into myself uh, from that point forward. That's great. Good advice. It's investing in yourself. It's not always an expenditure, right? It's an investment in yourself. Now, as you get back from, uh, you know, that mastermind with John Lee, you're like, hey, I'm going to record, you know, three episodes um, a week. You know, I'm really just diving in. I'm going to get after it. And you end up getting a, we'll just call it a partnership that you said, hey, if you're willing to promote me for a little while, uh, I think that would be beneficial for me. It'd be beneficial for you. And I think it was supposed to be a month and they ended up letting it go a little bit longer. So talk about that and the momentum that that gained you. And first of all, let me say, I appreciate you for doing your research, man, because it always makes a better conversation and not every podcaster does that. I do it a lot and I teach it a lot and uh, I can always tell when somebody actually has done it. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah so what happened was it was, uh, I was talking to my coach, my podcast coach, which again, point in the invest in yourself column. Yep. And he was like, yeah, when I started my podcast, it was when Stitcher just came out and uh, they were trying to gain, you know, steam Yeah, and they gained steam really quickly. And so he ended up doing like a partnership with Stitcher. Uh, he didn't even pay for it. It was just like his show was like one of the new good shows at the time, but new and noteworthy in Apple podcast uh, or in iTunes at the time didn't, didn't mean as much as it did when um, people like John started his show. Yeah. And, um, so he was like, I didn't get as much traffic from new and noteworthy, but when I got on uh, stitcher, I started getting like 10,000 downloads an episode within like six weeks or something like that. Wow. And wow. I was like, Whoa, my mind was blown, you know? And yeah. at the time I was like, well, you got lucky cause there's no stitchers around. And then I was like, well, maybe there is stitchers around. So I went and did some research and found a couple other podcasting apps uh, that were out there. And I cold emailed a few of the people finding emails and was just like, look, here's my podcast. So like six months in, I was like, I've interviewed this person, this person, this person. I think that it would be a great fit for a feature, you know, and they yeah. emailed me back and they're like, look, if you, if you do an ad read on your podcast to get people to listen to their favorite podcast using our app instead of these other ones, mm. then we'll feature you for the week as one of our featured shows. And uh, it was supposed to be seven days. And so we ran ads on the podcast for the three episodes that we launched in that seven day period. But they left us on that list for six months. <laughs> and on that one platform alone, my subscribers went from like 21 subscribers on that platform to almost 8,000 subscribers on that platform in yep. that six month period of time. So yeah, it ended up being a, a really big deal. I would have never, never, I would have never thought about it if I didn't talk to my coach. You know what yeah. I mean? Which again, another point in the invest yourself column, because that shaved a ton of uh, time off of my runway. Yes. So you continue to grow your following. You have, you know, great people on your shows. Um, <clears throat> but one that you highlight as being one of your, I would say, either favorites or most impactful was you got the opportunity to interview Grant Cardone. And you said, you know, that was a really cool, you know, moment, be able to do that. So talk about how that came to be. And, uh, you know, at what point in your, uh, episodes that that end up happening yeah so i i you know i've had a lot of really awesome interviews that i really in, enjoyed and and uh um that even i would i would say that were m even more meaningful than grant but the the reason that that one meant so much was that i had listened to his stuff for so long yeah like when i was first starting to listen to stuff i found gary vaynerchuk and i found grant cardone i found john lee dumas uh, found uh, Tim Ferriss and like Lewis Howes, maybe Jordan Harbinger at the time. There's yeah. a very few amount of people that I first started listening to. And when I yeah. found Grant stuff, I was still in door to door. So right. I was very much on the sales track and like, man, I love, I, I just wanted more of his stuff. And so when I started my show, he's one of the big people that I wanted to get on, but I was just like, man, this is going to be impossible. I don't even know how to even start getting in touch with this guy. Right. And uh, I eventually um, sent him a message on Instagram or something never even responded. And so I was like, well, I need a better reason for him to say yes. So I made a list of a bunch of people that I knew were in his network that he knew. And so for me, it was easy because 10X Growth Con was coming up. So I just copied down a list of the speakers that were going to be speaking. There. Yeah. <laughs> and so I got Brad Lee on the show and then I went and got Ed Milet on the show. And then I went and got Elena Cardone on the show. And then I went and got, uh, you know, uh, Lori Harder on the show and Carrie Kasem on the show and some people that I knew were speaking at, at his event. Yeah. And so right after his event, after the hype of the event, after I'd had all those people on my show, 
I reached out again. And this time I listed all of the people mm. that I knew that he knew that I had on my show. Yeah. And uh, instead of being ignored, he said, yeah, let's do it. And so I flew out to Miami. This was probably like six or seven months into my podcast. I probably had 200, 300 downloads an episode um, at the time. Like it, I should not have been able to interview him with yeah. the amount of uh, traction that I had at the time. But um, it just goes to show you that people don't really care about your download numbers. They care about wasting their time. Mm -hmm. And if you're somebody that isn't wasting people's time, like, like there was no way that I could have interviewed all of those people that he knew, liked, and trusted if I was somebody that wasted people's time in an interview. Bingo. You know what I'm saying? So yep. when I had the opportunity to interview Grant and you can watch it to this day, like you can go, you can go to YouTube and type in Grant Cardone, Travis Chappell, the interview pops up on his YouTube channel. And Love he it. says during the interview, like three or four times, like so, something along the lines of like how well prepared I was or that I really knew my stuff when it comes to his thing or, or that I'm a, that I'm a really good interviewer or, um, uh, that, uh, nobody ever talks about this stuff. So I'm glad you brought it up. So like there were multiple things that he said, and I think that's why that content's lived on in the last like two months, he's posted on like four or five clips on TikTok on YouTube shorts from our interview that we did like three years ago wow. that he's posted recently on his, on his, um, his channel. So, um, yeah, that, I think that meant so much to me because of how early on in my journey it was. And because mm -hmm. of how much I consumed his content leading up to that point. Yeah, that's awesome. So this, uh, you know, podcast itself grows to, like I said earlier, you know, uh, like 400 episodes, a million downloads, and now you're going to be pivoting. And we're not necessarily uh, done with that, but we're moving on to a new direction of podcast. So talk a little bit about what the new podcast is about. Yeah. So there's a couple of things happening with that. We, we released our final episode of Build Your Network and then basically realized we didn't want to let it go. So yeah. Um, essentially what's happening is that it's, it's not going to be build your network by Travis Chapel anymore. It's going to be build your network by Guestio and yeah. my content director in that company is going to be hosting a lot of the interviews on the show. I'll do some every once in a while as well. Um, but it's mainly going to be a Guestio show. Yeah. And then, uh, that'll open the door for me to be able to do my own kind of, uh, interview show that, uh, that I've selfishly been wanting to do for a while that just has a lower release schedule. And it's only like people that I'm reaching out to instead of taking a lot of pitches and bringing people on all the time and saying, yes, yeah. a lot of people, like, it'll be a lot more, like a lot fewer interviews, a lot less content, but ones that are, you know, really meaningful uh, to me. So that'll be the, the new direction of, of the show coming up. Absolutely. And lastly, uh, you mentioned Guestio. Talk a little bit about the app that you're coming up with, the business idea behind that. It, it's, a, it's a great idea. And, and to my knowledge, one of the first in you know that market that you're looking to get into. Yeah, man. So uh, it's kind of like Cameo, but instead yeah. of booking a 30 second shout out, you book a 30 minute interview with somebody that you want to bring onto your content channel, podcast, YouTube, blog, a virtual event, uh, mastermind, Q&A, whatever. And, uh, yeah, we, I just, I wanted to continue leveling up the people that I had on my show, couldn't find a tool that allowed me to do that. And so we said, well, why don't, why not go ahead and try to build it? I love it. I love it. Well, Travis, I want to say thanks again so much for your time today and being on and sharing, you know, a lot of the pivotal moments that have taken you from uh, selling things as a fifth grader to now, you know, running uh, one of the I guess, most infamous uh, podcasts and uh, everything in between. And uh, I hope that, you know, as your journey continues to grow, we can follow up again in, you know, three years from now and uh, circle back around and say, hey, what have been the pivotal moments since then? Awesome. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to that. Thanks so much for having me on, Phil. Have a great day, Travis. You too.